to the history of the founding of Rome during the reign of the first Roman king Romulus. Rome was founded in 753 BC, which is a date that everyone should remember, but its beginning starts much earlier. In this video we are going to be using Google Earth to look at the actual places, and I would also like to thank the Barrington Atlas for permitting me to use their um, excellent ancient maps. Um, Barrington Atlas can be found in most good university libraries and also can be purchased online. The story of Rome here on the Italian peninsula begins much earlier, back in the ancient world during the fall of Troy. Troy was a city out here on the northwest coast of today modern Turkey, ancient Anatolia, and the story is that one of the princes of Troy named Aeneas, who was very pious, was ordered by the gods to carry his father out of the burning city as it was being sacked by the Greeks. And carrying out his father, as he was instructed to do, he accidentally lost his wife, who was following him, but got lost behind him. And so she died in the destruction. Aeneas, with his father and with his band of Trojan survivors, sailed out of Troy and sailed down through the Mediterranean, wandering the Mediterranean for many years, until he finally came to Carthage, where... Dido, the queen of Carthage, tried to catch him and keep him and make him and his Trojans add to her city there. But he was instructed by the gods to keep going and find an, found another city far off. So he passed on to Sicily and eventually was brought to the coast of Italy in Campania. He landed first down nearer to Naples or Pompeii, went into the underworld at Cumae, the Cumaean Oracle, and heard from her what future great deeds he would have to undertake, and eventually sailed north to land in the region of Latium in central Italy. Now at the time, in Latium, at the city of Ardea here, there was a people called the Rutuli, and their leader was called Turnus. And Aeneas had to beat Turnus in war and kill him, basically in order to marry Turnus's fiancée, who was a princess named Lavinia. All of this, by the way, was on command of the gods. And after Aeneas did that, he founded his own city nearby called Lavinium, in honor of his wife. Well, generations passed, and the offspring of Aeneas eventually came to rule a city up here perched on the edge of a volcanic crater, called Alba Longa. Now, Alba Longa is the first real true ancestral city of Rome. Today it's the Pope's summer residence called Castel Gandolfo. I kind of think of this as the true Middle Earth, because Gandalf, the Pope's wizard, lives there. as He's known as the Pope's astronomer. But this was the original royal line of descended from Aeneas living here. Now, one of the princesses of this line was named Rhea Silva. She lived maybe 300 years after Aeneas, and she was forced to be a Vestal Virgin by her evil, scheming brother, who wanted to become king himself and become the rightful line. So he thought, well, if she becomes a Vestal Virgin, then she can't have children. Voila! Now my children will become the future kings of Avalonga. Well, Aeneas was descended from Mars, and Mars and the other gods were not going to allow that to happen. So Mars himself came to Rhea Silva, and she became pregnant and had twins. So the story goes. Now, of course, <laughs> a consecrated virgin having children, maybe we might have another explanation today. But... Back then, this is the at least the official story, and who knows, maybe, maybe something like that did happen. It wouldn't be the first ancient scripture, if those of you who have ever read Genesis, speaking about divine beings coming down and causing humans to, be, to have children. So, she became pregnant with twins, and in the scandal of it all, her evil, scheming brother decided to blame her of infidelity and had the twins thrown out to be exposed. Now what is exposing? In the ancient world, if you had a child that you didn't want, 
or more likely just couldn't support, then what people commonly did was they would just leave the child out in the wilderness to die. Today we would be horrified at this. This is, you know, criminal. A child needs food and a parent and all that. But in the ancient world, when you just couldn't support children, especially children who were malformed or, or just too many, the theory was, well, if you leave them out in the wilderness, then maybe either a god can save them, or perhaps even another human being might come along and what commonly happened would be to enslave them. And that's kind of what happened here. Because the two children were put in a basket and thrown into the river Tiber, which is this great river which today goes through Rome. And the basket came to a rest on this bend in the river here. And along came a she-wolf and found the kids in it. And the, so the story goes, nursed them to health. And so the Romans built a grotto here called the Lupercal Grotto, right here on the southwest edge of the Palatine Hill. And we recently found that grotto today. It's very ornate and beautiful underground cave, which for the Romans was a shrine, kind of like their founding um, Plymouth Rock, almost. So the she-wolf nursed them, and along came a shepherd, found the boys, thought, hey, I can use some help shepherding my sheep, and adopt them and raise them, and they grew up and survived. Well, they grew up and finally learned who they were, because they weren't too far from the Alba Longa, and then someone would have heard the stories and put two and two together. Two twins, two twins. And so they came back to Alba Longa, and whether or not they were, they at least claimed to be the two royal twins. And of course, you know their names were Romulus and Remus. Well, they returned to Alba Longa, greeted their mom, seized the kingship from their evil scheming uncle, and became kings of Alba Longa. But Alba Longa was pretty big and doing things its own way, and they didn't really want to be kings of Alba Longa. So they decided, hey, let's go back to that place where we were nursed by the wolf, and let's found a city there. And so they went back there, and because, you know, there were, you can see in purple and white here, these seven big hills. Now, it's kind of hard to see them today, because the valleys have been filled in and the mountains have been reduced to make way for various building projects throughout the ages. But you can still kind of see that there's several hills there. Um, the Aventine, the Palatine, the Esquiline, Kylian. Capitoline is a major rock. Viminal is still pretty big there, Quirinal. And so they decided, the, these two twins, that we're going to fortify the tops of these hills and we're going to build a city. And so that was great. And then they just got to the issue of, well, who's going to rule the city? And both boys wanted to rule. Well, Remus decided to pray. And he said, oh, gods, give me a sign. And in ancient times, this was common. You would look for vultures or some other bird of a particular god. And lo and behold, Remus saw six vultures. and said, behold the sign. I'm, I'm certainly called to be king. Romulus didn't like that. So he himself prayed to the gods, Oh gods, give me a sign. And behold, he saw twelve vultures. Well, they got in a fight. Because Remus, standing on the Aventine over here, was saying, Well, I saw vultures first. And Ramus, Neulus, over here on the Palatine, was saying, Yeah, but I saw more. So the dispute continued. And they both started building their separate cities on their separate hills. Romulus put a wall around the top of the Palatine. Remus started to build his wall around the top of the Aventine. But in ancient times, you don't just build a wall. Because there's a, a deity who owns that hill. And so first, you have to consecrate that ground. And you would go around the edge of the wall, you know, saying prayers and sprinkling sacred incense and water and things, and wine and making offerings, maybe killing a cow at each corner. And this was a major ceremony, and after you had finished it, this place would be holy. And you could then build your wall in peace, because you had pleased the god, placated the god of the place, whoever that god might be. 
So Romulus did that, and he finally built his wall up to a sufficient height. And, you know, when you build a wall like that, it's a sacred thing. You don't cross a consecrated boundary in the ancient world. Well, Remus came across, and perhaps he didn't know that Romulus had consecrated his wall. And he said, oh, look at your puny wall, and jumped across. And Romulus, either out of piety towards the god of his local hill, or out of just vindictiveness... And sheer rage... Struck Remus down and killed him. He said... You know, so may it happen to anyone who crosses the wall of Rome forever after this. Well, that was the end of Remus. And so Romulus kind of, for better or for worse, became king. And that's why his city to this day is called Rome, not Reims. Well, Romulus was living down here next to this huge civilization to the northwest. You can see all these yellow markers. Kairi, Vei, Carcili, Velsna, Volumni, Clusium, Vetlunia, Philathri, Aretium. This, in 700 BC, was the huge civilization of the Etruscans. And this was the very height of their power. Each of these cities was huge, and to this day you can find huge cities of the dead outside their main cities. Well, Romulus didn't want to be some little backwater. He wanted to equal them and be as big as them. And he only had a few people living with him on the Palatine Hill. So he decided, hey, I'll invite all the riffraff. And that's what he did. He sent out invitation to all these refugees and exiles and criminals and runaway slaves and said, hey, come to my city and you can be citizens. And everyone liked that. That's great. So thousands of people started flooding into, or maybe a couple thousand, flooded into Romulus' city. But as you can imagine from refugees, exiles, criminals, and runaway slaves, most of them were men. So, how were they going to... <laughs> a lot of these discontent men wanted wives, women. How are they going to get women? Well, Romulus had a plan. He said, noticed, well, out there are the Sabines, and just northeast of here, and we'll have, hold some games. This was common in the ancient world. You'd have games in, to honor some god or some festival or whatever, and we'll invite all the athletes and give, give prizes. And so they held games, and Romulus said, okay, but here's the plan. We're going to get all the Sabines drunk the night before, and then at my signal, the day of the games, while they're all drunk, um, each of you grab the, the hottest looking Sabine girl, Sabine young lady, and we'll, we'll just steal them and take them back to Rome, and that'll be fine, and we'll have our, our city that can grow now, because now we've got wives. Ha ha ha. Common young guy, teenager thinking, not thinking about the future. Well, they took up their plan, and Romulus gave the signal, and they all grabbed their women, and while well, the husbands and fathers were drunk, wondering what was going on, and ran out of the place and tramped back to Rome, and entered Rome and slammed the gate shut, and thought everything was great, right? Ha ha ha. Well, <laughs> they had just violated perhaps the most sacred ancient virtue of hospitality. In the ancient world, and even to this day in places like the Middle East, uh, you may be mortal enemies with someone, but if they come to you as a guest, you are obligated to treat them with the greatest respect and hospitality. And the Romans had just done the exact opposite by running off with all the girls. So, the Sabines sent to all their allies and friends and told what rotten, stinking hotheads those Romans are, and we need to teach them a lesson, and show a lesson to the whole place what happens when you do something like this. So they gathered this massive army that outnumbered the Romans like four to one, and marched down to Rome, and camped outside Rome in the Campus Martius. Now, Rome 
had its citadel on the Palatine Hill here. But there was a smaller wall that enclosed the capital line and the forum, but it was defensible. And with the hills especially, it became even more defensible. So the massive Sabine army camped out here in the Campus Martius, the field of Mars, the field of war. And out came, to get some water, this Vestal Virgin named Tarpeia. And Tarpeia saw them all sitting out there and renewed what they were there for. Sprouted a plan. Walked into their camp and said, Hey, all you Sabines, I got an idea. Um, you give me that thing on your arm. And she pointed to all the silver and gold bracelets that they had on their right arms, by which they carried their wealth around with them back in the age when there were no purses or bank accounts. And she said, you give me all those things on your arms, and I'll let you into the city. Now, Tarpeia was a Vestal Virgin, and that's not right, because if a Vestal Virgin was supposed to maintain the sacred fire of Rome, even to this day, you can see the Vestal Virgin's circular little temple there in the Forum. But their job was to maintain the hearth fires of Rome. They should certainly be pious and not let people in Rome. But Tarpeia thought, hey, the Romans are going to get wiped out here, and now I'll be friends with the Sabines, and everything will be fine. I'll get away with it, and I'll be rich, too. So she made them swear. Yes, we swear we'll give you the thing on our arm, and you just let us into the city, and so that's what she did. She opened the gates when no one was looking, in marched the Sabine army, occupied the Capitoline Hill. Suddenly the Romans realized what was going on, and they made this last-ditch defense here and right in the middle of the Forum. And so a huge battle developed in the Forum as the Sabines from the left, from the west, were advancing towards the Romans from the right. And the Romans' plan was to, you know, if we lose, we can retreat to the Palatine. Well, they were fighting in the forum, and along came, guess who, to save the day? The Sabine girls, the young ladies. They interposed themselves between the two armies and said, Hey, hey, we don't want to lose either. We don't want our fathers to die. But on the other hand, we like these hot-looking young men and who clearly love us and have been telling us some good things about how we're going to enjoy our lives here and everything. And so we love them too, fathers, and we don't want you to kill them either. Can't you guys work this out somehow? And so the two sides put down their weapons and started talking and bargaining, and finally they made a peace treaty where the Sabines and the Romans would combine and be the same people. And the Sabines could settle in Rome and, and eventually they did settle up here on the Quirinal Hill. So the Sabines settled, made the treaty, and everybody made friends, and there was lots of crying and joke-telling and la laughter, and everyone was extremely giddy and happy because they had just survived a battle, and the situation had gone from awful to wonderful in just the space of an hour or two. And then, guess who they noticed slinking away? that traitor Tarpeia. Ha! Huh. Now in the ancient world, um, violating hospitality is bad, but being a traitor in the process is even worse. And they said, hey, look at that traitor Tarpeia there. She's the one that let us in. And everybody was horrified at what Tarpeia had done. So they grabbed her but Tarpeia said, hey, 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 you swore to me that you would give that thing on your arm. Give me what was on your arm. And, you know, you can't do that to me if I'm dead. So the Sabines got to thinking, and suddenly they realized, hey, we didn't say which arm. Well, you know, all our bracelets are on our right arm. But, hey, on our left arm, we carry these huge, heavy, bronze shields. And so, ha, ha, ha. They decided to give her what was on their left arm, and so they all threw on top of her these heavy bronze shields, 4,000 bronze shields, and before you know it, Tarpeia was crushed to death under the weight of the shields. So they buried her here on the Tarpeian rock, 
And ever after that, the Romans would throw their worst, most hated criminals off the Tarpeian Rock in honor of Tarpeia. That was her claim to fame forever after that. <laughs> so you can see that that rock is in the southeast corner of the Capitoline Hill. And even to this day, it gives you some idea of the imposing height of the hill, what it used to be compared to the valley. And so that became the Tarpeian Rock. And life returned to normal in Rome. It's happy for everyone except Tarpeia. And Romulus continued his kingship, co-ruling with a Sabine king named Titus Tatius. Titus Tatius eventually died and Romulus ruled alone and got old. And then one day there was a thunderstorm and Romulus died. Well, some say he died. Some say a different story. According to another story, one guy swore in the forum in the Curia that he saw Romulus ascend to heaven off the Quirinal Hill. <laughs> so the Romans liked that story better and took the guy at his word. And so they said, well, Romulus has become one with the god Quirinus, the local god Quirinus. And so they named that hill the Quirinal Hill. And ever after that, they called the Romans Quirites. Not, not Quirites, but Quirites. And to this day, the Quirinal Hill houses the Roman government, I think. I think that's the Italian parliament right there. And this massive palace, which I think was owned by Mussolini, but it has these wonderful, nice gardens with all the Roman pine trees and all that. And it's a big hill. It's the northwest hill on the city of Rome, Quirinal, Viminal, nearby. And so Romulus went to heaven and was deified and became worshipped forever after that as the god Quirinus, or Quirinus, as the, the Romans would say. So that's the end of the story of Rome of the first king. Next video will be on the other kings of Rome. Just remember the general area. To recap, Aeneas lands at Ar and fights Turnus at Ardea, founds Lavinium, then his offspring goes to found Alba Longa, and Rhea Silva, one of his offspring, has twins who found Rome, Romulus and Remus. The other city that you might need to know is the port city of Rome over here, Ostia, which was farther inland. Um, to this day, you can see it's a perfect hexagon harbor, because um, it used to be that the shore was right here, but you can see that the river has deposited a lot of sediment so that the shore is farther out nowadays. Okay, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the first video. And... Well, later.